Welcome everyone. Welcome to Goodbye Facebook. Hello, Decentralized Social Media. We'll get started in just a few minutes. My name is Wendy Hanamura. I'll be your host today. I'm the Director of Partnerships from an organization called the Internet Archive, one of the world's largest digital libraries. We're so glad you're with us. And we have a very timely topic to talk about, Decentralized Social Media. I think it's actually time for me to turn this over to Davis, who is with Metro, our true host today, the Metropolitan New York Library Council. Thank you so much, Wendy. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Davis Aaron Anderson. I am Director of Programs and Partnerships at Metropolitan New York Library Council. We go by Metro for short, and you can find us on Twitter at MNYLC, which is our initialism. I'm really grateful to our co-presenters at Library Futures, Internet Archive, and DWeb for uh, working together on this, this series. It's a six-part series. We are on session four. So if you haven't come across us before and you'd like to stay tuned and see what else we have in store, uh, please do. Please do come along for the rest of this wonderful journey. We'll be meeting through the end of June. So as we go, we are looking forward to a robust conversation with you all. Um, so if you would uh, like to share your comments and your questions in chat, that would be lovely. We also have the Q&A feature. If you'd like to use that instead, that's your call. Um, but feel free to, to speak liberally there. We are all ears. Uh, we do have a code of conduct, however, so we do require uh, civility in our chat today. So um, you know what that looks like. Be, be kind to each other, be kind to our speakers and our presenters, and we'll all get along just fine. We are working on a resource guide that you will receive in your inbox in the coming days, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we do have a link where you can see the current version. Uh, my colleague Mary is dropping that into chat, so uh, check that out. We have, um, this is our fourth guide, so you have, we're building a library for you to refer back to. So if you want to know about the decentralized web and the various aspects thereof, we have lots of reading for you to do. So I will drop a link later on to the webpage where all the series information is held. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Wendy Hanamura. Wendy is really the brain power behind this whole series, and we're so grateful to her for um, sharing all of her wisdom with us and connecting us to really great speakers. And I'm looking forward to today's speakers as well. So thank you, speakers, for being here. Wendy is Director of Partnerships at Internet Archive, and she's helping to produce the six-part series, Imagining a Better Online World, Exploring the Decentralized Web. So thank you so much, Wendy, and over to you. Everyone, welcome. Welcome to the fourth session in this Metro series called Goodbye Facebook, Hello Decentralized Social Media. You know, after this week, maybe we should be calling this Goodbye Twitter. I wanted to share the game plan with you briefly. I thought we'd mix it up this time. You know, there is such a buzz about the big news of the week that Twitter is going to be purchased by Elon Musk. I thought I'd like to bring all of our speakers who are such experts in this field to talk a little bit about the Twitter takeover. And then we'll go back to our plan and Jay Graber, who is the CEO of Blue Sky, is going to give you a very bird's eye view of this, this sector of decentralized social media, its potential and its problems and where we are today. And then I've asked two founders of two different decentralized social medias that you can use today uh, to demonstrate them. You're going to be seeing a demonstration of Element, which is think Slack, but decentralized, and also Manyverse, think Facebook, but decentralized. Let's, let's get out of slides and let's just bring everyone. I'd love to introduce you to our speakers. We have Matt Hodgson's, who co-founded the Matrix Protocol and Element. We have Andre Stoltz, the creator of Manyverse, which he calls social media without the bad stuff. And also Jay Graber, CEO of Blue Sky, the company funded by Twitter, but not owned by Twitter. So welcome. Andre, Jay, and Matt. This is quite an intense week for all of you, I know, but uh, perhaps no one more than, than Jay. Uh, Jay, what, what has this week been like for you? Pretty crazy. I, I, I think a lot of people are asking me questions like I have a, you know, inside info on what Elon's thoughts are, and I really don't know, you know, he doesn't DM me, so. <laughs> well, about four months ago, uh, you were funded as a, a um, by Twitter to create some new avenues in the decentralized web. And this is a moment, I'd love to share this slide that I always think about. Um, the Chinese say that a moment of crisis is really two things. It is 
danger meets opportunity. Crisis equals danger plus opportunity. So my question to the three of you is this, in this moment when Twitter has been taken over by the richest man in the world, what do you see are the dangers and the opportunities of what's happening? Andre, let's start with you. Something like this happens once in a while, uh, crisis of this type. And it usually means that people start installing Miniverse and different alternatives such as Briar, Matrix, um, Mastodon and so forth. Um, so for us, it's clear opportunity. People are excited about uh, what we provide as an alternative. Um, the opportunity side there is clear. Um, I think the danger, uh, if I could summarize, is that there's this transition period where let's say, you know, let's, let's assume that Elon changes Twitter significantly to disappoint a lot of people. Um, and those people will look for an alternative. And if they don't, if they don't, they don't feel satisfied with the alternative, if the alternative is not ready, like if Miniverse is not ready, then they feel stuck. Like I, I want to leave that, but I can't join this yet. So that's kind of like, it, it, it becomes a, a problem that they don't have where to go um, since their platform is being changed. So I think, I, I think it's most likely to be just an opportunity. I don't believe things will significantly change uh, under Elon, maybe a little bit, um, but that's to be seen. So let's see. Matthew, how about you? You come from the UK with a little bit of a different perspective on this. Yeah, I think it's a really um, interesting time to um, see how things evolve. Um, there is definitely a pretty optimistic interpretation and also a really pessimistic kind of dystopia which could come out of this. And it's interesting that Elon's stated reasons for purchasing Twitter is to change the moderation system to allow for completely unfettered free speech which um, could be interesting if it's combined with a reputation in the moderation system that allows people to block the stuff that they don't want to see. And you no, know, charitably, one might hope that there is a situation where very perversely, the world's richest man goes and uses his powers for good by going and counterintuitively purchasing this outfit unilaterally and then almost making it a commons going and making it available to everybody and empowering people to block the content that they don't want to see. Or alternatively, it could go the other way around and he then owns all of the data and the metadata which is sitting on the platform and he doesn't put the moderation that's in place and the entire thing sort of melts down in a terrible sort of hellscape of everybody being obnoxious to one another without the sufficient controls to empower people to filter out the stuff they don't want to see. So it's certainly got potential to be an experiment. I'm cautiously optimistic on it, but it will be strange if you had to do this very autocratic action in order to potentially completely democratize the underlying conversations. Well, there's much to dig into your utopian vision, but I wanna go first to Jay and, and see how you would answer that question. Yeah, I, I think everyone who works on decentralized tech in this realm always knows that something like this can happen because the crucial thing about centralized system is I say they're high variance, which means they can move very quickly in any direction, which is for good or for bad. And so that could mean one person can just take it over. And that one person could be Elon Musk. It could be Rupert Murdoch. It could be George Soros. And depending on how you see the world, these could all be better or worse outcomes. And so I think that just at a high level, this turn of events really demonstrates that social networks can, that are centralized can change very quickly. And then those changes can potentially disrupt or drastically alter people's identity, relationships, and the content that they put on there over the years. And so I think this highlights the necessity for a transition to a protocol-based ecosystem, because over the long run, the kind of system that's resilient to abrupt change, which could be good, but also could be bad, and you want to avoid the catastrophic worst cases, is one where you have a open protocol for core components like a person's identity or social graph, and these things are user controlled and resilient to disruptive change. And then you get other properties of the system, which I think when Elon describes parts of what he wants about Twitter, it's similar to what we want out of decentralized systems in terms of wanting you know, more user control and things like that. Of course, there's other things that diverge. And he has his, probably his own ideas about you know, how moderation should work and things like this. But uh, I think that creating a, a, like a system in which 
we have neutral infrastructure under the hood and then build opinionated systems on top is a way where we can maybe achieve the best of all these worlds. That's actually a really good point. Uh, if I can just say something, because I was going to bring up a very similar point um, in that the, the, the fact that these platforms can change um, is a feature and it's a feature that they wanted from the beginning. Uh, back in the days, 2004, or whatever, when social networks, they were still discovering it, you know, the like button didn't exist at that point. Um, it was good that they could like pivot quickly, figure out what people like. Um, the retweet button didn't exist at that point. Uh, so change was a good thing back then when they were discovering social networks. I think at this point, we're kind of like, okay, we know what this is. We kind of get the hang of it. And it would be good if it would not change. Um, sort of like email, you know, at some point, like people build infrastructure and all their business and things on top of email. You don't want email to like completely change over overnight. So I think uh, what decentralization gives and email is a protocol is the immutability. So the fact that, okay, this is how things work and it's very hard to change it actually. It's, it, it, it's a very slow process that requires a lot of people to agree, okay, yes, let's go to that direction. So I think uh, it's, it's going to be a feature of social networks that they are based on protocols, that they don't change. And also the acquirability, if I could just add another thing, the fact that the social network can be acquired is a feature also. When they started it, you know, they want the company to be have an exit possibility and that's what we're seeing here. That brings up a tweet that you uh, did maybe two weeks ago. This was before Elon Musk took over, although there were hints that it was coming. And, and you wrote, Andre, no billionaire could buy secure scuttlebutt, SSB, even if they wanted to, because there's no single entity to buy. They would have to buy or blackmail every single user. And this gets harder and harder as the network grows. Can you explain that to someone who is unfamiliar with SSB, why couldn't I buy it? SSB is a protocol. Um, another thing that would be a protocol is email. Another thing that would be a protocol is the English language, which is spoken not just in America, but you know around the world and in India, et cetera. So no one can say, I will buy the English language now because you'd have to ask all of the English speakers, can you please stop talking English now? So it's a similar situation that it's it's just rules that people use to talk to each other. Email is that, um, and Scuttlebutt is also that. It's a bunch of rules that computers use to talk to each other. Could I buy Miniverse? <laughs> Basically, no. I mean, you could buy me. Like you could like somehow purchase my skills and make me stop developing the app, but the app will still be there. It's an APK file that people can still download. And the file in itself, I mean, they can still communicate with each other and the network still exists. Probably the de development would not go forward. Um, at at 10,000 people, it's not too big. So maybe you could like talk to 10,000 people and pay them. But when it grows, it gets harder. But the point of, if I understand it right, Scuttlebutt and Manyverse and many peer-to-peer -peer protocols is that there is no one central hub, no one central server um, where I could block it to censor it or buy it or um, even tamper with it. All of the data is sent peer to peer. So those 10,000 people hold their own data, send their own data. Is that correct? Yeah, that's precisely, yeah. I wanted to say just one thing about what Andre said, which is making social protocols immutable. Um, I think we have to think about all the things that are currently bundled into social networks. And it's actually many things. It's identity and it's data and it's, you know, hosting your data and it's getting a feed. And actually some of these pieces should be more of a protocol, like identity is maybe one of those things that should like be more, you know, stable. But then other things like, you know, buttons for features and apps on top of it should and can change even in a protocol based ecosystem. Like you can build different apps over the same data. So there is, it's not like the whole ecosystem is just frozen in time now. And that's something that you don't want when you do protocol design. It's just that the things that shouldn't change because they're slow moving and people rely on them for, you know, integrity of experience over years, like, you know, how, what their username is, like that should be more the same and then other stuff can change on top. Thank you. Well, I wanna get back to our original plan. So I think I'm gonna say goodbye to Andre and Matthew for, for just a second. Let's talk a little bit about the state of social media. Uh, 
if you are on social media right now, you're blocked in Russia. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, um, the platform still owns all of your data. They follow where you go. They can monetize where you go. Uh, it's a little bit of a brawl, like being in a bar. A, a lot can be said, lies can be spread. And if I wanna take my marbles and play elsewhere, it's actually pretty hard to go elsewhere to take my followers or my content. So decentralized social media is structured to change that balance of power. And remember the stack that I keep going back to in these sessions. Well, decentralized social media, we believe um, is kind of in the middle of that stack that you can decentralize every layer of the web stack from storage to content addressing to applications and identity. And that's kind of the sector that decentralized social media protocols falls under. Jay Graber is a longtime friend and associate. I think I first met you, Jay, in 2015 when you were battling for net neutrality as, as an activist and an organizer. But Jay is now the CEO of Blue Sky, which is quite confusing because it was funded by Twitter, but it is not owned by Twitter. It's actually a public benefit corporation owned by the team that runs it themselves. And, and Jay can explain that more. But when it was first articulated by Jack Dorsey in, of course, a tweet, uh, he said that he wanted a team to develop and drive large scale adoption of technologies for open and decentralized public conversation. So it's in many ways an R&D lab. And I've asked Jay to come and give you a high level view of where they are, where the field is, and why it's important. So turning it over to you, Jay, thank you for being here. Thanks. I mean, one, one thing I just wanted to say, just framing what I'm going to present here. I also have in the past done these talks with Wendy where I give an overview of the decentralization space and talk about like how we see all the various pieces in play. And so I kind of prepared a presentation at that level as opposed to being more specific about Blue Sky because I wanted to frame the kind of work that Matthew and Andre is doing in the broad arc of what is decentralized social? What even is decentralization? Why should we care? How are we going to get there? When is it going to happen? Uh, so that's my presentation, but just to give you guys a brief intro about Blue Sky, which is now the org I'm running. Um, so we're a public benefit LLC actually, and uh, we are, as Wendy said, in R&D mode right now. Um, before we even started this company, I was just engaging in a actually a matrix chat room um, with some people who Twitter had pulled together to discuss the concept of Blue Sky um, since they announced it in 2019. And so the gap between 2019 and 2022 was just us discussing ideas. And in that time period, I said, we should do an ecosystem review of everything that's out there. So I went out and this was something I wanted to do anyways, um, but I asked Twitter to you know, support me to do this. And I uh, you know, interviewed Andre, I interviewed Matrix, I interviewed a lot of people in the space and then wrote this overview, which you can find um, Maybe we can share a link afterwards, which I think gives a good deep dive into a lot of the projects in this space. Um, and so that's kind of how we started. And right now we're looking at uh, what's the current state of the art now, because things are constantly in motion and what could we do uh, to help accelerate for mainstream adoption? And so in our mission statement, there's several things. One is public conversation. And so that doesn't mean we don't think privacy is important. It's just, we're focusing on public style conversations like what happens on Twitter where all these, you know, threads are flying around of people responding to each other, kind of all in the public domain. Uh, and then another is uh, like large scale. And so that really means uh, thinking about scalability and how do you get the same kinds of features? So the stuff that, you know, the mainstream has come to expect, um, which, you know, it sounds counterintuitive, but something as deceptively simple as like a consistent number of likes on a tweet across the network. Like, how do you get that in a decentralized social network? It's actually a somewhat complicated question. Um, or something like when you search a term, do you see all the tweets in the world referencing that term? Well, somebody has to go find all those tweets. Uh, and if it's decentralized, those could be living many different places. So these are some of the questions we're looking into. Uh, and with that kind of a brief aside on the work we're doing, um, there'll be more on that published soon. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and dive into the slides I prepared to frame the space in general and just talk about decentralization at a higher level and then diving into social media. So this is my 2020 snapshot overview of decentralized social, but backing up even one step further, um, because I was told this was perhaps a non-technical audience, just going into the concept of decentralization in general. So decentralization, what is it? Uh, 
Why do we think it's important, particularly for social media? How do we want to achieve it in social media? And when is this going to happen? These are the kinds of questions we're gonna explore here. So what is decentralization? This is a classic picture from uh, early internet, and it shows an example of a centralized network, a um, decentralized or distributed network. And um, these network structures are actually kind of analogous to you know, the two kinds of networks are going to be presenting. Matrix is the, something that looks a bit federated like the one in the middle and you know, peer, the peer-to-peer -peer architecture of uh, SSB and Manyverse kind of looks more like the one on the far right where all these nodes are just communicating directly in this gossipy way. So that's the kind of overview of just a general shape of what different kinds of decentralization could look like. But it's really not just these three forms. Decentralization is a whole spectrum. And so on one end, you have centralized services uh, or current platforms where uh, one company runs a database or you know, multiple databases, but it's all run by one company. And uh, that stores all of the information in the social network, the posts, the users, the relationships, anything that happens. And on the other far end, we have something that's fully decentralized. And that could be something like SSB, um, where as Wendy earlier described, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Every single device and person in the network is sort of its own node of the network communicating directly with other nodes. And this could potentially go even further if you relayed this over a mesh network. So even the physical infrastructure could be peer-to-peer -peer if you say, send SSB posts through Bluetooth from phone to phone. And then a lot of stuff is really in the middle. And so um, in the middle, we have some architectures we call federated and matrix, which is going to present is um, a federated architecture where you have multiple servers that are people's home servers and these all communicate and then anyone can run a home server. So it's an open system and it's not controlled by one company or um, one database, uh, one person controlling a database. It's many databases communicating. Um, but there still might be this concept of a server and a database. So just in general, why would we want a centralized versus a decentralized system? These have different properties. And I don't think there's anything actually inherently good or bad about centralization or decentralization. They work in different circumstances for different use cases. And so some of those kind of general system properties of systems that are centralized are they are unified uh, because they are all one thing. They're part of one system oftentimes hierarchical controlled by one person. And they are homogenous because they have this structure. They can all align around one thing. Um, this means that they are concentrated. They can concentrate resources in one place. They can concentrate energy and direction. And that means they can be very decisive. They can just decide to move one direction. Like one day we're doing this, the next day, nope, we're doing that. And then the whole system, no matter how big it is, can all just move. And so that's a very, that's a centralized system. And of course, remember this is a spectrum. A lot of things fall somewhere in between, but you know, an ultimately centralized system would just all be acting as one unit. Like all the atoms in your body are centralized in your body and it's moving as one unit when your brain tells it to move. And the opposite of this is decentralized. And so you know, this can be, instead of unified, it's spread out, it's diverse. There's a lot of different parts rather than all of it parts being one system, even if they're all held together in some way. And um, instead of being concentrated, uh, resources can be diffuse. They are and spread in different ways throughout the network, maybe completely evenly distributed, or maybe there's a few concentrations, um, but there's like a, a different distribution. It's not all in one place. And instead of making one decision where they all go one direction, decentralized systems tend to explore many different directions at once because all the parts are autonomous. It's instead of a human, it's like an octopus. Like each arm has its own thoughts and it's kind of moving in its own direction, doing its own things, exploring and sensing and making decisions even on its own. And so why would we want that for social networks? Um, because society as a whole is facing a lot of crises. And I think we have uh, the ability to, as a whole, as a collective intelligence, investigate a lot of directions at once. But uh, we don't actually have the free ability to fully do this in our current social architecture because um, we have the web, which is a decentralized network, like websites themselves uh, communicate through decentralized protocol. And that allows allowed innovation in many directions at once. So like all the websites that you visit, these are all you know, an example of an innovation of one person or one group making an independent decision to just put something up there on the web. And that's the decentralized protocol that enables that. But now social networks are getting a bit ossified and it's hard to experiment in many directions at once. It's hard to like 
add the features you want to your social network, or if you have a cool idea for a way to view your feed differently, you can't just throw it in there because the company controls everything from your identity to your social graph, to your hosting of your data, to the way you see your feed, to even the color of the buttons on your screen. And so you just can't go in and change that. Um, and so if you decentralize, you get the ability to innovate and explore many more directions at once. Um, and this means ideas like interfaces, all sorts of things, and all the parts, and in this system, parts could be people, uh, parts can be companies, parts can be uh, technical you know, architectures, all the parts get more freedom and autonomy and uh, power gets distributed throughout the network. So now you have maybe still centers of power. We don't necessarily end up in a network that's totally flat, but now you have different centers of power and there's checks and balances because maybe people have the freedom to move between them. And having all this, this different distribution allows more realities to coexist. So you can have um, a world that looks one way over here in one part of the network and it looks different in this other part of the network. And um, the, I think a key thing about thinking about how to decentralize social is what needs to be decentralized. And uh, I think infrastructure is what needs to be kept neutral. And we have to think about the difference between what is infrastructure and what is you know, stuff that can be opinionated and should change fast. And like I was saying earlier, um, you know, Andre pointed out some stuff should kind of freeze now. Like I think we should take some things that have emerged as features like our identity, maybe it shouldn't really be features. Maybe that should become a core web protocol. And the things like the colors of buttons should be you know, opinionated and we should be able to experiment with those and those shouldn't be you know, codified at a core protocol level. So how do you decentralize things? Uh, the platform looks roughly like this. You have all these things bundled together. You have the app that you use and that app, you know, you have a username and that's your identity. And that username and profile is tied to other people and those are your relationships. And the stuff you post is your data and it's handling all the networking. You don't even think about it. That's like a, the integrated social app that we have now that's centralized. And the way to think about splitting it up into protocols is, you know, you have probably a lot of differences in the apps and on top of the apps or in the apps, the kinds of, you know, algorithms and feeds and like different interfaces you can see. Um, but then maybe some things will be consistent and split off into their own layers, like identity, it will be, you know, a protocol component, uh, data, how you post your data, like who hosts it, where it's hosted, how it's moved around, that gets, you know, put into a protocol component. And then networking, how you communicate, maybe, maybe that's another protocol component. So just to give an overview of the space, I made this graphic a while back to show some of the historical and current federated protocols and applications in the social space. And so I've broken up the stack in this way where we have user-facing applications and you'll see that in federated networks, user-facing applications are generally where the split is between the app and the rest of the protocol, which is one thing. Um, and then you have matrix right here, uh, for example, um, and it's, you know, similar conceptually to like XMPP, an earlier predecessor, um, also different in some key ways, but also similar conceptually to like ActivityPub where, you know, Mastodon is. Uh, so this is just a, a brief overview of different, you know, kinds of federated protocols and how they break up the app and these other layers. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer protocols, they're actually quite diverse compared to federated protocols because you potentially um, make different protocol decisions around these identity data networking layers. These become their own protocol components. You might actually have to think about networking rather than just like leaving that to something that happens on the web you don't think too much about. Um, and the user-facing applications, I put Manyverse in here because that was around at the time. Um, that's in the SSB ecosystem. And Manyverse is an application built on top of this protocol, SSB, that has these different components, subcomponents of the protocol that define what your user identity is, how your data moves, um, how it gets around. Uh, and then one thing I want to touch on is blockchains because uh, the things that we're presenting here for decentralized social networks today aren't blockchain-based social networks. But I think recently there's also been this cultural trend of blockchains taking off. And I think this is also a very important one for driving decentralization, but it means that people start to understand decentralization as exclusively referring to blockchains. And that is not the case at all. And in fact, blockchains are logically centralized they provide an ability to, in a dis way that is politically and architecturally decentralized to emulate a centralized database that everyone agrees on. And so they're very expensive way to do that. And generally you probably only want to use them in my opinion for things that you need that kind of agreement on like money. We can't both say that we both own the same Bitcoin that would make it unusable as a currency. 
Um, and we might not want to both say that we own the same name. Maybe that is another place where we need to split things off. But in general, blockchains are you know, not the only kind of thing that you have as decentralization. And they're not even fully decentralized in you know, the fully peer-to-peer sense because they have this idea of logical centralization. Now, that's not good or bad. It's just used for different things. So I wanted to touch on that. Uh, and then when are we going to decentralize? <laughs> so I think actually decentralization and centralization comes in cycles for technical architectures, maybe even for societies. Um, and you have this period of bundling and centralization where to get to be decisive, to be unified, to get efficiencies of scale, um, to discover business models like you know, uh, data collecting, advertising that benefited from this, you get into this like centralization feedback loop. Um, but then when the, some of the pressures and contradictions created by that centraliz centralization feedback loop start to tear the system apart, you get decentralization. And I think there's both proactive and reactive um, like involuntary decentralization. And trying to build protocols and get people to use protocols is a way of proactive voluntary decentralization, saying, you know, we think that this is the way that things should move. And there's a lot of momentum for this. But there's actually, when people just leave and use a different site on the internet, or they leave a site entirely, or they go off to private communities and stuff like that, that's a form of involuntary de decentralization, which there isn't a protocol uh, kind of that's a, still a common uh, sort of thread holding these people together, but they've just all gone their different directions because the tensions of the current platform, the ways that they can't serve all their users, the ways that they can't set a single policy that works for a billion people, that just like starts to tear the thing apart. And so I think we're in this spiral of unbundling and decentralization and people doing the work in this space are thinking about how to proactively decentralize things so that we can essentially create a new language that allows people to you know, live in a society together where many different realities can coexist. Um, otherwise, everyone just kind of goes off in their own world and becomes unintelligible to each other. So that's my very high level introduction. Thank you, Jay. Jay did a great job of talking conceptually about why we want decentralized protocols and how they kind of work. But I want to show you two people who've built them and you can use them yourselves. So first, I'd like to bring on Matthew Hodgson's. He's the technical co-founder of two organizations, matrix.org and the app layer on top of it, element.io. Now, Element Think, as I said, Slack, but decentralized. And I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Matthew since 2016. And now, you know, to see Matrix serving 55 million people, Matthew, is phenomenal. So please show this, this group how it works and how they can use it. Well, thank you, Wendy, and thanks for the opportunity to explain what we're doing uh, with Matrix. Um, so before I jump into the presentation, uh, uh, the demo, I'll just um, show the architecture of Matrix very quickly so that people know what we're talking about, although Jay has some slightly stolen my thunder. As Wendy says, 55 million users on this network of about 85,000 servers. People like Mozilla, the United Nations, the entirety of the French state are using this as a way to run their own Slack or WhatsApp style capability, but they run it themselves in their own countries on their own infrastructure, securely communicating together. And the network looks like this. You have um, servers run by different parties, and this is the federated approach that Jay was referring to earlier. The green dots are clients like Element, for instance, our flagship client, which runs off it. And then you have bridges which connect you through to other systems. So we see Matrix as a glue between um, things like Slack or Teams or WhatsApp. Um, you can use Matrix natively, but you can also punch through to these centralized silos. And finally, the way to think of Matrix is as a specification with lots of different servers uh, which can talk to one another. And then also lots and lots of different clients, some written by us, some written by the community, even things like Mozilla Thunderbird, which um, speaks it now as a way to provide real-time communication. And it looks like this. So this is my personal Matrix account. I apologize that there is lots of red blinking lights here and it's a bit scary. Um, because I'm something of a power user. I've got five and a half thousand unread messages here. And these span over 6,000 different chat rooms. I mean, the scale is very, very big. And um, this particular room I'm showing here is called This Week in Matrix. And it's got um, however many um, 100, uh, 600 people in this particular room. 
And if I look at them, now here I am on the right hand side, and I am at Matthew on matrix.org. So I'm using a server called matrix.org, but this room is replicated across many, many different other servers. Like this chap, Rich VDH, is on a server called sw1v.org. Now, the real novelty of Matrix is that a chat room like this, with people going and comparing what happened this week in the Matrix community, um, is uh, uh, the conversation itself is replicated equally over all the participating servers. And if I put on my techie hat and go into under the hood quickly, I can view the servers in the room and I get a list of all the different servers which are participating here and the number of users on each server. And as you can see, it's several hundred servers. And quite a lot of them are on the kind of original matrix.org server, but then everybody else is coming in. There's the element.io server. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, probably if we looked in this, we would find Mozilla and possibly people on the internet archive, who knows, would be flying around on it. And I can't actually talk to somebody on a different server without equally sharing ownership of the conversation with them. So we call this subversive decentralization. Um, I literally can't talk to somebody else without like bilaterally or multilaterally sharing ownership. So there cannot be um, Elon Musk or a Zuck or a Jack Dorsey in this model. The, uh, the fact that it, it, you know, if one of these servers goes down, um, it can be reconstituted, synchronizing it in from the others, and there is just no um, owner. Now, you can have different permissions for the users within the room. So here I am as an admin, and then this guy is there as a moderator, for instance. But um, the actual integrity of the room is replicated everywhere. We also have some nice features like spaces here, which allow you to go and narrow down the set of rooms you're looking at. So I could go to, say, the element corporate rooms here, and I get taken into one of the rooms, a telemetry test room within element corporate. And I might I know, narrow it down to, say, rooms about cryptography, at which point I've actually narrowed it down from 6,000 rooms to about six or seven different conversations. Um, flying around here. So this is how you navigate this massive network of different conversations, some public, some private. Another thing I could show you here is if I go into a room like an Element demo room, we have the ability to embed applications into these chat rooms. So here we have an Ethereum ticker, although I hasten to add there isn't any cryptocurrency link with Matrix. It's just an example of an app you could put there. Or you could embed in a video conference like this one, um, using the Jitsi video conferencing system. Show you a conference within a conference, like so. Um, and um, as a result, everybody in this room will end up seeing the same view of the same um, content, um, basically allowing you to build a dashboard on it. Now, Matrix is fun because it's a very, very generic protocol. Here, Element, as an application, originally called Riot, um, is going and providing a Slack or Teams style user interface. But for instance, if I go to a web browser, um, here is a totally different app called Cerulean that is a clone of Twitter built on top of Matrix. Now, it's a very simple proof of concept. And uh, we built it out um, to demonstrate to the Blue Sky project how you could build something like um, a Twitter system on top of the Matrix protocol. And uh, you can see we have threads here. And I've gone and posted some images. Um, we have things like the ability to subscribe to different reputation feeds. And if I want to, I know, hide particular content, um, I could go and you know, dial down the volume on some of these messages and they will get blurred out. And so it has the concept of relative um, reputation. So empowering the users to decide whether they want to see NSFW content or not, and then fade it in and out or hide it as needed. So we, we think it's quite exciting as an example of how you can build um, a completely different idiom of you know, Twitter style threads and a large world model on top of Matrix. Another one would be Element Cool. So this is a Zoom um, clone. I um, hope nobody at Zoom is listening, where we've gone and built it on top of the Matrix protocol. If I jump into a um, room like this, and start the conference, it's created a matrix. Oh, hello, Amandine. So this is my co-founder, Amandine, who's demoing against me. Um, so this has created the matrix room called Hash Metro on the Element Cool server. 
And I can just copy this um, URL, take my iPhone here, um, go through to Safari on my iPhone and paste it in and hit go. And it prompts me for permission to the camera, hit the join button and hey presto, I should be able to jump straight in. Sorry. Um, yeah, I can jump in straight like that on my phone without having to install any software. But the interesting thing is that the protocol being used here is matrix. So it's end-to-end -end encrypted using signal style encryption. It's um, decentralized. This could span multiple different servers. And under the hood, it's just a matrix chat room, but one which we're using to create um, a decentralized Zoom style experience. Another thing I can quickly um, show you is um, peer-to-peer -peer matrix. So Jay earlier described matrix as federated and everything that I've shown you so far is indeed um, federated. Now this I'm gonna to have to show on my phones. So you might need to look at the video feed rather than my screen share briefly. But um, if I uh, go and I'll just stop sharing so that you can um, see this um, for sure. So on my iPhone here, I've got a peer to peer version of the element app and I can jump into a room on it like so, and you can see a whole bunch of random messages. On my Android phone, I have the same app here, and I can jump in here and start saying things like, I know, hi, and messages come through. Now, this is properly peer-to-peer. -peer. It's fully decentralized. There is no server here, and I can prove this by going onto airplane mode on my iPhone like that and send some more messages um, from Android, and you can see them coming in here on my Android phone. So what's happened is that each app has actually got a server now built into it. So even though this doesn't have internet connectivity, it's using Bluetooth to go and dynamically connect the two together. It's really quite a magical experience, such that if you don't have any um, you know, 4G or Wi-Fi, worst case, you can go directly between the two. So that is where Matrix is going in future, historically federated, but in future peer-to-peer -peer hybrid as well. And then as a final quick demo, something that no one has seen before, world first um, here, is a totally different experience on top of Matrix. I'll just share my screen again. This one is called Third Room, and it's a metaverse client built on top of Matrix. So you can see a bunch of chat rooms here called Test World. I can go and jump into one of these. And it has put me into a basic 3D environment, which is built on top entirely of Matrix. So there are no servers here, no infrastructure apart from the Matrix protocol. Now, if I go and very quickly open up another window and jump into that same world um, here, then hopefully you can see this green cube here. This green cube is actually my other user here. And if I move around on the right hand side and I jump a bit, you can see that the other person is interacting with that. And it's very basic. This is only a few days old, but I can do things like fire cubes out. So I can look up in the sky and create a big stack of cubes, which then go and fall on top of me. And we literally have created a matrix style. Well, let's face it, the project's called Matrix. Um, virtual world, which is entirely powered using the same social media environment. So rather than being stuck in a dystopia where Facebook have renamed themselves Meta and trying to co-opt the metaverse for their own commercial activity, um, here we have a completely decentralized open world using the same technology on Matrix. That's welcome to Matrix. That's phenomenal. And Matt, uh, just that peer-to-peer -peer matrix that you've achieved is amazing. I mean, think about the use cases, folks. In the Amazon, peer-to-peer -peer technology is being used between indigenous people who have to map the, their territory without any internet. It can be used that way. Um, quite famously, Dominic Tarr, who created Scuttlebutt, did it because he lives on a boat in New Zealand and he just wanted to talk to the other boats in, in his area, it could be used that way. I mean, that is really honestly game-changing and, and thank you for showing us and for revealing your uh, never be seen before application of it. Well, we'll, we'll come back to you because there are a lot of uh, naughty K-N-O-T-T-Y hard questions uh, about some of those things you showed like the filters. But I, I wanna introduce to you Andre Stoltz. 
Andre comes to us from Finland, uh, he, but he's building on uh, something called Scuttlebutt, which was first created in New Zealand. And uh, Scuttlebutt is peer to peer. And as you, as you said, it can be used in Ma Maniverse as a Facebook-like alternative without the bad stuff. So Andre, show us what you've got. Great, thanks, uh, Wendy, for having me. Um... I'm going to actually start by just showing my miniverse on my phone. I suppose everybody can see this. Um, so there's a lot of content going on, a lot, a lot of people here. It's a really nice community. Um, I just like to go to the top and show here. Uh, Jay used to be on Scuttlebutt. Um, so this is Jay, the other speaker. Uh, she posted a year ago. She also followed Cinnamon. Cinnamon was a great person. A uh, great contributor to our community. Unfortunately, uh, Cinnamon passed away. And this talk will be dedicated to Cinema. Uh, we love you. Um, that's my little beginning. My name is Andre Stoltz, and I created Miniverse five years ago, and I've been working on it since then, uh, funded by don donations. It's an open source app, and it's available for download on mobile and desktop. And it's used by approximately 10,000 people, so not quite the scale of millions as Matrix, but um, there's an active community, and we like that, and we see how it's going to grow in the future. How does Maniverse work, and what is different about it? So it works in a way that should be very familiar to you already. Everybody who has a smartphone has a very special app, which works differently to the apps that you're used to, and that's the gallery app. Um, let me invite you to reflect a little bit on why it's different. Every picture that you take with your camera is first stored on your phone. Now, you might have a cloud backup system, but the photo lives primarily on your phone. It's available when you're offline. There are no terms of service because there is no service. There's no company taking care of it. This creates a true sense of ownership and responsibility. There's no way that one day you wake up, you open the gallery or the photos app and your photo is gone because it was taken down. That, that doesn't happen. So you own your, your content. And if you delete a picture, there's no person that you can call to and say, hey, could you please recover it? So therefore responsibility. And pictures don't just stay on your phone. So they're share, shared to all sorts of places. So you can share them by email, you can share them by social media apps, or even airdrop to devices nearby. Pictures are just content, so text is a different kind of content, and social media is just text and pictures. So the big question is, why can't social networking work in a similar way to your Photos app? And it can. That's what Maniverse does. When you post on Maniverse, it's just like you're taking a picture. It ends up as bytes stored on your device. It's actually a pretty lonely experience in the beginning. It's just like using the notes app. Uh, but what makes it truly social is when you share that post. And this happens automatically in Maniverse whenever you're connected to another person. Your phone can create an encrypted connection with another phone, and then they can automatically get a copy of your post to the other phone. And this is how they can read it, they can interact with it. And this also works for likes. So um, a like is just a tiny piece of content, which can also get uh, copy pasted to the other side. Now, this is very important and it's very different to platforms. There is no place where this conversation is happening. There is no um, servers that are hosting this content and we're accessing it, that doesn't happen. The data is just copy pasted from one phone to the other. And this is how people can interact. It's really just a big community of people who are copy pasting their content to each other's phones. But instead of a literal copy paste, it all happens automatically through a peer to peer protocol called SSB, such that you don't have to think about, okay, now I'm going to copy this to that friend. It, it all works under the hood automatically for you. Our goal with Maniverse is to look and feel like a normal social networking experience, such as uh, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. 
but under the hood to fundamentally transform the heart of social networking. Because we want users to have the sense of ownership and responsibility for their content, as well as to trust other users and to practice hospitality. To address the question that was posed today, can peer-to-peer -peer lead to less toxic online platforms? Can Miniverse lead to less toxic conversations online? And my answer is absolutely yes. And there's three ways how we can achieve that. Uh, removing the media from social media, reducing the inflow of random people, and emphasizing data hospitality. Social media contains the word media, which means mass media. In other words, information broadcast. It's the capability of informing the entire world about something. Social networking, in my opinion, is different to social media. One of them is about having a network of friends and about interacting with the friends of your friends as well. The other is about any individual being capable of broadcasting information to the world and boosting that information via retweets. I, I honestly think there is some value in mass media, uh, but the vast majority of use cases for social networking do not need to become public information, such as talking to friends, discovering people with common interests or hobbies, being part of small communities. None of that needs to be mass media. So virality is not something that's really built into Miniverse. We think that websites are already pretty good and newsletters as well for broadcasting information to the world. And uh, reducing the in inflow of random people. To join Miniverse, uh, you actually have to be invited by someone already on Miniverse. And this may disappoint a lot of people because there's no way of searching for someone on Miniverse and following them. But let me remind you that Miniverse is like the gallery app. It would be pretty weird and wrong if a random stranger could suddenly take a peek into your gallery app. Even if you didn't have a lot of personal photos, it's still very weird. The natural way is for you to invite someone that you trust to gain access to your content. Turns out that if everyone invites people they trust, then that already becomes a filter to prevent bad actors. The only way a bad actor can enter into your metaverse is if one of your friends invites them, but that means that you also end up losing trust in your friend and maybe you block them as well. So all of this creates incentive for people to think twice when they send an invite. And as a result, there's virtually no bad actors on Miniverse. And finally, uh, emphasizing data hospitality. If you're indeed copy pasting people's contents to your phone, then you're literally uh, holding their data on your device. And you don't want to have illegal content on your device. You don't want to have toxic content here. So this leads to you taking care of your phone's storage and deleting content that doesn't deserve space, which in turn means that you're taking an active role in pruning and caring for the social network, deleting people that don't deserve to be heard. And my last slide is about adoption. So uh, can this have any chance against Facebook and Twitter and Instagram? Honestly, I think it's pretty hard to compete with the network effects and the polished technologies uh, on, on these platforms. But there's one thing that we can count on, that they're pretty fragile. And every time those platforms tremble, people install Miniverse. And this is not new to me. Uh, one day, it's just a billionaire buying the platform that causes people to lose their trust and look for alternatives. The other day, it's Facebook that goes offline for a, a whole day. In other countries, people who cannot use social networks anymore because they're in an author authoritarian government that shut down the internet. This, is, this happens about like every six, six months in my experience. So centralization is fragile. And every once in a while, there's a crisis on the platform and it shakes the people's trust in it. Um, but on the other hand, we really like social networking and it's here to stay. And a lot of our society depends on it. So my bet is that social networking needs resilience. And Miniverse is an answer. It's a network that's spread among thousands of devices, not on any single data center. So it has a natural immune system against bad actors, the invites.
little by little over the course of decades throughout all of these crises on the platforms, I believe people will discover that their own devices are the best place to store uh, conversations online. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Andre. Really, really interesting. I'd love to invite back Matthew and Jay, and we can tackle a few questions. I want to warn our audience that we are going to go over the one hour mark. And if you have to leave us, we understand. But I think there's so many interesting things to talk about. Let's, let's answer some of these questions. Billy and many others are asking, what are your thoughts on Mastodon? I think Mastodon is not really an, an answer for, uh, for power, um, for the problem of power abuse in, in networks. Um, one basic example is that all of your direct messages from one to, to another person on another instance can be read by two people that are not involved in the conversation, the admin of the instance you're on and the admin of the instance on the other side. I think those problems can be very worrisome and there's a lot of um, cases of instances that go offline. Things are very, it's very difficult. I think the federation model is, is tricky um, and it, it's prone to a lot of uh, politics and drama. So I think a better model would, would not suffer from that. So in other words, Andre, um, Mastodon is a federated system. So I may not be on somebody's centralized server, but I, I'm probably not running my own server. So I'm trusting Matthew to hold my stuff. And then he sends it to somebody who's on another server held by another person. And I can't really be sure that Matthew's not peeking in on, on my stuff, but I trust him. And maybe I trust him more than I trust Facebook because I know him. And so I'm trading kind of proximity and closeness in, in, in this equation. Yeah, and the Mastodon um, uh, dynamics, which we've seen, it's got so much um, potential. And the, the good news is that the app, um, I personally think the user experience is pretty high and good, and it has been inspirational to a lot of people in the decentralized web community, that it's possible to get a pretty good level of polish. But I completely agree with Andrew's point that the moderation system is, has, is just not fit for purpose. So the strategy that they took was to block servers on a server granularity. So if there is a particular instance run by somebody, and for whatever reason, you on your own instance don't like that admin or a user on it or a community on it, who knows, you basically could have uh, the, well, the, the thing that people do is to just um, black, uh, block it entirely. So you get real fragmentation, real on a censorship done just by the admin of a server that you're on. And it creates huge drama and it's very counterproductive and it's sort of how not to do decentralized reputation. Whereas the approach that we've been looking into is the one that I briefly showed on Sarah Leon, where you empower the users to decide who um, they talk to and where the content goes. And so you, it's very rare in Matrix for somebody to actually stop two servers talking from one another because that would be drastic. That's almost an anti-net neutrality thing that you would sort of go and rip up the roads between the cities and prevent people from being able to travel between them. But instead, you empower the users to make up their own mind. And it's, um, I mean, it obviously also has problems because uh, the reputation lists could be used by bad guys for your personal value of bad to find each other, as well as the good guys. But um, it's a shame that Mastodon has got stuck in this model. And it's really a knee-jerk reaction against um, some of the early shared block list activity that happened on Twitter, which got a lot of bad press because it was abused, because it was too uh, naive. And then they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater and said, right, we're not going to do any shared block lists anymore. Instead, we're going to be even more nuclear and just stop entire populations talking to one another. So let's see if I understand this correctly. We have many questions around what in our world we call content moderation, the balance between free speech, censorship, and bad speech. So let's just give you a hypothetical. All right, in Maniverse, let's just say I got into your network and you and I are in the same uh, social Facebook-like platform because I know a friend of yours. And let's just say I'm a hate monger. In fact, I'm, I'm saying hateful terrorist uh, level things. How would you get rid of my hate speech, Andre, in Maniverse? 
everything in SSB is kind of flipped upside down. So instead of free speech, we have free listening, which means if you're that kind of person, I uh, will block you and I won't read that anymore. But blocks are more consequential than on Twitter. On Twitter, you could just make a new account and continue to interact with me. Uh, on SSB, you would have to be re-invited um, or make a new account, be re-invited and regain trust. It's, it's a big deal. Um, and we, we're going to develop a system. Basically, there's a master's thesis uh, by Alex Cobley and uh, there's an algorithm called TrustNet, uh, a system where basically if your friends, uh, so basically if my friends would block you and I trust my friends enough, then I would auto automatically block you as well. It's a way of sort of shielding the community so that I don't have to manually choose, oh, there's that hateful person, I will block them but my friends on my behalf could help me auto block uh, these kind of hateful interactions. So Andre, I just have to say, taken to its extreme, don't you end up in a social network only with people who share your views, who are friendly and look like you, sound like you, think like you? Isn't that a danger in, to democracy as well? I would like to say yes to that answer because uh, it would create a little bit more shielded community. But I think that is a different case than the so-called filter bubbles that we've seen in modern social media. Um, I think since always, um, communities have been very um, sort of shielded. And um, you see this in like clubs and indigenous communities. They're very still very, very shielded against outsiders. And I think that's okay. And I think we've operated in that mode for a long time. What we've seen with filter bubbles on Facebook and et cetera. That is different. Uh, it's fueled by all kinds of maximizing, engaging type of features and virality. And I think that's different. Um, I think to have communities and to have boundaries is healthy. In Maniverse, I get privacy. I get uh, some control over content and I'm trading kind of the universal access to all thinkers for a a closed, comfortable group that I'm going to trust. That's where my trust comes from. Now, let's talk about element and matrix. I am that hate monger. I'm in your Slack room um, or your chat room. What do you do about me in element? Yes, I mean, the answer in the long term is really very similar to Andrew's one. And the work that Alex Cobley has done with TrustNet is not dissimilar to the approach that we're taking with Cerulean, um, except we're less about what we call transitive trust, where if my friends trust somebody as being good or bad, then I inherit it. Instead, we make it more explicit and let the users choose really which reputation feeds they will mix together. So it could be that they automatically inherit it from their friends, or it could be that they explicitly subscribe to, I don't know, Obama or Trump or whatever their sort of favorite um, influencer, to use a horrible social media term, um, who is publishing their reputation feeds. And that would then um, effectively let the user control the algorithm that they see. And to bounce on what Andre was saying um, earlier, the most important thing that we see is the ability to visualize uh, these filter bubbles. Like the bubbles are a good thing in the, if you filter something necessarily, you've created a bubble, which is that filter. But the really toxic thing is if you can't see it and if you can't curate it and change it. So today on Facebook, you have no way of knowing what content has been randomly filtered from you and you have no way of changing what you get shown similarly on twitter today but in real life um no if i want to go into some dodgy bar right now and hang out with a bunch of neo-nazis i can and i know what i'm doing i can see who it is and i know that it exists and i choose to do so or i choose not to whereas you don't typically have that flexibility on social media, either centralized or decentralized today, but that is very much the model that we're looking at to almost gamify the curation and visualization of the reputation feeds, literally visualizing it as a map, like a 2D map. You look at all of the communities out there and you say, well, this big block of people empirically will hang out in Nazi rooms. So I'm gonna stick a flag in that and I'm gonna dial down the volume on that one. 
but this community over here are all, I know, the, the metro community, and I think they're great, and I'm going to stick a pin in there and dial up the volume, and so tune the content that I can see out there on the network. Now, there, there are risks to doing it this way, because obviously it allows bad people to find bad stuff as well as good people to find good stuff, but it's better that than having a authoritarian view dictated by Zuckerberg's censorship monkeys. Okay, so let me see if I can put this in real terms for our viewers. Right now I'm on Twitter and uh, I am a neo-Nazi espousing hate and violence. So probably in Twitter today or Facebook, certainly there are thousands of content moderators that they've hired to find me and block me, or at least put a little, you know, be careful of this, this woman. Uh, and, and many people would call that censorship. And let's just say you're warned and Matthew sees me and he decides, oh, I'm never gonna listen to her again. I'm gonna block her. It's kind of a binary thing. I'm gonna listen to her or I'm gonna block her. But in Element or Matrix, um, you could just dial me down. You could, you could make me 10% of your algorithm so you don't have to see me every time, but you know, once in a while you wanna turn me on and see what's happening with me. And then there are these reputation lists, right? And so you're, you're creating these new interfaces so I can kind of see the communities and where they live. And you realize that I am in the hate mongering neo-Nazi community. And so you can stay away from that, but okay, what you just said, if I am a neo-Nazi looking for other neo-Nazis, you've just made it incredibly easy for me to find, congregate, organize, uh, your end-to-end -end encrypted, I could be fomenting violence and war and no one would know. Oh, except people would know because <laughs> the same technology that allows the Nazis to go and find each other and hang out, which already exists in the real life today. And I go onto Google and I search, where can I find other Nazis? I'll get a whole bunch of results coming up. And so I could go on the internet archive and I could go and you know, look through the historical archives to see where people, bad people hang out. And then the problem of basically policing society to make sure that you know, America doesn't turn into a fascist Nazi haven or whatever the problem might be, ends up being the job of the conventional authorities for better or worse. Because just as if the cops thought that a bunch of terrorists are hanging out in the bar and getting ready to do some dastardly crime, they're going to infiltrate it, and they're going to do a sting operation, and they're going to arrest everybody. The same things which work very well in real life can be applied here to use the same technology. So it, I find it quite fascinating that people do go and proudly declare that if I know ISIS, for instance, uses Matrix. We can't stop ISIS from using Matrix because I can't stop them using the web or email or any other technology. And they actively recruit and they literally stick a flag in their heads of their room saying, if you want to go and cause trouble um, in the Middle East, this is where you should go and get involved. But by so doing, I imagine that they're probably going to be on the radar of many intelligence services who are interested in what bad stuff ISIS is doing. It's really a question of um, having the freedom of information. It's just like the Internet Archive has a mandate to archive everything and no, we're in the same position, and that's the ethical responsibility on us to then empower the users to be able to navigate that information effectively and safely and not accidentally fall into a cesspit or you know, find obnoxious content if they, unless they really, really were in that mode. Well, let's stick with the ISIS example. Let's say I post a beheading video. Now, right now, in almost every social media platform, they will take that down because they have the power to do that. It's on their servers. In your systems where there are no servers or where they're federated servers, could you take it down? You can in Matrix on a, uh, on a given server. So what we are already doing is publishing reputation lists of stuff that you will not want on your server, assuming that you are uh, in a you know, country where child abuse is illegal and beheading uh, terrorist content is illegal, then we will publish um, already block lists for these rooms. And by default, people who join the network and run a server, one of the first things they will do is to go and subscribe to these reputation feeds and make sure that those rooms can never hit it on the server. 
But unlike Mastodon, where you're blocking an entire random server community of people, in Matrix, you're literally just blocking the individuals or specific rooms which are known to be toxic. Now, if you want to get a visit from the feds, you might choose not to engage that um, block list, and you might then join all of these rooms and you know, book plane tickets to Syria, or whatever does it for you. And okay, that's a choice you might want to make, and you'll probably regret. But um, for everybody else who doesn't have nefarious um, purposes, either they will just use that existing um, block lists. Andre, how would you handle? I, I just want to say that there are servers in, in Skaroba, um, but they are very different to the servers in a federated system. The servers in Skaroba, they don't hold any data whatsoever. There's really no data there. They are just a meeting point. So uh, two people can be connected to the same server, and then those two people will have an encrypted connection. So this means that if we know about a con, some beheading content, let's say, um, we cannot take it down from the service because it's not on the service to begin with. But it's useful to think of the social network as like as a spider web. You know, there's like this part and there's that part. And I think a person who is uh, doing that kind of violence, uh, they are connected with other kind of people, um, and those people. Um, they are so it's just kind of like a gradient. So the people who are connected to the very violent people are somewhat violent, but not extremely violent, and then so forth. So if I block enough people, that content won't reach me. And so our answer is that we can't control what other people have. Like I cannot delete a picture from your phone even if I would like to, but I can be far enough from you so that I will not get your content and I will not pass it forward. So that is our approach. And it's really fundamental that we have to say we cannot do that because if we say that we can do it, then we have a power to do otherwise as well. We can take something good and we can remove it. Um, so I think the, the question here is not, um, do I choose to do good or do I choose to do bad with the power that I have? The question is, do I choose to not have that power or to have that power? And I think it's important that we learn from these centralized platforms that they have power and we've learned about the problems that that thing has. Zuckerberg has done a pretty okay job running Facebook with quotation marks, please. But what if Facebook would be bought by someone extremely horrible for society, like let's say Putin or someone? You know, that power should not exist, is, is my point. Eloquently said, Andre, Andre we're, we're taking, taking back, back the, the power, power but, but with power comes responsibility. And that's, that's what these decentralized networks would do. do. They, they put, put the responsibility for what, what we see, what we say, who we associate with back in our own hands. hands. Yes. Matthew, you, you said there was one takeaway you wanted everyone to have at the end of this hour. What was that? It was only that some decentralization really is coming of age now, as you've seen from the demos on both the Maniverse and SSB and the Matrix and Element side. We've gone from being sort of science projects to something that can genuinely be a contender to the Twitters and the Slacks and to WhatsApp social media experiences and I think it's a real turning point the, the Jay had her pendulum earlier or her kind of twisty spiral going from centralization to decentralization and I believe we are at the fastest moving point on that curve as the uh, pendulum swings from one side to the other and in the kind of utopia vision where Elon turns up and uses his autocraticness to set Twitter free and make it democratized for everybody and possibly build it on a decentralized protocol like no, any of the ones we've been talking about that could change everything you know twitter could become a search engine say a bit like google exists on the open web twitter could be an ad and a search company just like google is today except on top of blue sky or matrix or ssb or any other decentralized thing so in the good scenario where elon sets twitter free um that would be fascinating in the dystopia where he then becomes emperor over the, the galaxy of um, 
Twitter and um, if you know, moderation is what he thinks is good, then we're all doomed and I for one will be moving everything to SSB Matrix and Mastodon as rapidly as I can. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying over. Thank you for explaining about this power balance and this power this moment uh, that we're in. And we we do this for all of you because we want you to know that you have the power. You can take back the power, but you have to understand it and understand your responsibility. Thank you everyone for being here. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, and I wanted just to remind you that this is the fourth of six sessions. There's two more to go. We're the last Thursday of every month. The next one is about the metaverse and the next big thing. And yes, that starts with an N, NFTs. And then finally, we'll be looking at the ethics of the decentralized web and how it's being used in humanitarian work and journalism and in the law. One more thing, I want to push this incredible guide written by Aditi Shaw, created by Irina Nijinska. It has much more resources, uh, videos, deeper dive articles, uh, many, many things if you want to learn more. So we'll send that to you. There's a link that we're dropping in the chat. It's on Internet Archive. It's on getdweb.net. It's on Metro. Uh, we want you to use this, share it, and, uh, and learn with us. Okay, thanks so much.